So that's what the book is doing. It's kind of connecting and saying, look, the old domain, the classical physical universe is all about energy, but the mental domain and the quantum physics is all about information. And let's talk about the information. So this, this particle wave duality, energy, information duality, this, you know, we're focusing in on the information side and starting to have the conversation about the information. And most transcendent experiences, you can't explain by, quote, energy. You have to explain it as some informational process, like astral projection or remote viewing. You have to say, okay, there's a mechanism there, but it's primarily informational, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so that's 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 where I'm coming from. Is the, the physics is the basis for the source of everything in the physical universe, and so I call it source science, and the source science is the basis for the, our mind too. So that's what ties it together. So. Yeah, no, that that makes perfect sense. And for me, when you when I hear you speak, it's like it feels like we're taking the woo out of the woo woo. And we're actually Absolutely. then taking the science and, like and, and really starting to, to meet these aspects from both ways. Because when, yeah. once we start to have um, language and an information and a process to bridge that gap, it, it, it really allows us to then lean into this as opposed to dismiss it without even looking at it, which I think Absolutely. as Westerners, we get encouraged. I don't, know whether, I don't know if it's encouraged is the right word, but it's just not in our radar for many people. Yeah. Well, in the UK, they're probably more keen on metaphysics just because of the history of a lot of metaphysics work and research was done in, in the UK, right? Um, but um, but in the US, it's it's really the critics and the physics people and the critics um, that are and the classical physicists people um, that are the that are the the people who are attacking. They're the attack dogs of the industry, right? And so, but even the people who invented quantum mechanics, they all believed that there was something bigger <laughs> than classical physics, not only from the quantum physics, but consciousness. You know, they talk, a lot of those people talked about consciousness too. So, yeah. And, and you, you, you talk about universal mind and mind as well. I've heard you mention that a couple of times. I want to pick you up on that. And what's your thought about our mind then? Because I know there's a lot of theory about the, the fact that the brain is more of a receiver as opposed to creating yeah. consciousness. And what, right. what are your thoughts on this? And what's your research led you Absol to believe? Absolutely. Well, once you realize that, that a lot of these behaviors that we have for, for metaphysical behaviors, right? Like astral projection and remote viewing and uh, retrocausation, they don't deal with normal space and time, right? They, they violate what we would consider you know, if you have a remote viewing session, you're violating what we know about classical physics because you're looking at something that's remote. So how is that possible? And, and the same thing with precognition. If you have a remote viewing experience, experience and an experiment even that they've done where you're looking forward in time and you're looking at a newspaper from two days from now and you're describing what's going to be in that newspaper from two days from now, how is it possible to do that mm -hmm. both in space and time? So you have to have a mechanism. As an engineer, I'm just saying you have to have a mechanism some way that that's allowed, right? And it turns out quantum mechanics can do that. And the way it does that is that the fundamentals of quantum mechanics is that it says that there, every quantum system has these own independent little private dimensions. And it turns out, that's what I did for my dissertation, was show that those dimensions were literally bits. In other words, it's not just the bits that we have in computer science, but this is the bits of physics. That's why I call it bit physics now. And it basically says that physics owns bits as well. And once you start realizing, oh, there's a bit infrastructure in physics to support quantum mechanics, and that's what I did my PhD on, showed that you can do quantum computing using bit physics, uh, using a, a different kind of math called geometric algebra. And you can show that it produces qubits and ebits and, and standard model and all this other good stuff. So once you realize, oh, these bits, what are they though? They're in infinite dimensional, hyperdimensional space where each little thing is like a little toothpick, but there are an infinity of them. And those are the dimensions that form the substrate of the physical universe. Right. Does that make sense? So it's like the matrix. It's like a quantum version of the matrix. Okay. The movie, the matrix where you have this, this, this infrastructure, this layer in physics 
that is an infinite dimensional, hyperdimensional bit physics domain. And in that, it's powerful enough to simulate anything, including the entire physical universe. Wow. So our classical universe is essentially a simulating running on that giant simulator. There's two. There's a word I want to pick you up on: hyperdimensional, and I'd love to break that down a yeah. little bit more. Because I, w what you just said, made me think of my interview with um, Professor Donald Hoffman I had on last year, and, um, okay. and he he um, uh, the case against reality, and he spoke about something giving rise to physical form, and I and I kind of yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So, what does hyperdimensional mean? Does that mean it's coming out in and out of our three D reality to something beyond? Or? Well, I mean, you're familiar with flat world ideas, right? Where you have a two dimensional world, and and there's some there's some good YouTube videos out there by Fred Allen Wolf about flat world. Right. Okay, so you essentially imagine if everybody was a two dimensional being, they would just live in a plane, right? us as a three-dimensional being would be able to look down on top of them and see inside them, outside of them, see their house, inside their house and outside the house at the same time, right? And they wouldn't be able to see us because we're outside of the, we're in an extra dimension that they can't see, yes. right? So so if you take that analogy and raise it up one level, it says, okay, now imagine that we're in a three-dimensional box and now there's a four-dimensional being that can actually come down and, and, in, and look at us the same way. That's what cubist art was all about. Cubist art was all about looking at both sides of the woman's face at the same time. Huh. Okay, so it, once you start realizing, oh, this, how do artists represent multi-dimensional, higher dimensional spaces? Well, now I imagine that that you have an infinity of those dimensions, but they weren't full-fledged dimensions like we were. These little tiny little proto dimensions, and they're made basically bits. So it's like a computing infrastructure for the simulator that runs the universe on it. And it turns out that it's a powerful thing to do. You can do you can you can build things with that, including space, time, matter, energy, wow. just using a bit infrastructure. Okay, and there's other people that are working on these ideas as well. Uh, so does that make sense? So this hyper so it's hard for people to imagine if they can go from a two dimensional to a three dimensional, and then from a three dimensional to four dimensional. You kind of get the idea of what I'm talking about. And so one of my, if you want to think of it, my superpowers is that I can visualize this hyperdimensional space without getting lost. Got it. I, I, okay. There's, there's a thing. I remember um, when you mentioned Fred Allen Wolf there, and there's a, there's a fantastic cartoon on YouTube with like Dr. Quantum. Yes. I've, I've se I'll, yes. That's yeah, him. I'll, I'll, that's I'll him. link it in the show notes. I remember watching that a couple of years ago. I think yeah, that's it's a great. really great way of looking at it. And I'd encourage everyone. He does great. Yeah. Things. And yeah. of that very thing where we, we rise in above dimension. So are you saying that yeah. every time we rise above that, that can be infinite back to, to, to source you essentially if if it, it turns out that each qubit you know so we have bits yeah. okay and each qubit can have two of those dimensions in it that's what i showed for my dissertation right. but then it turns out to guilt to build an entangled bit you have to have two qubits so that means every entangled bit and this is the same no matter which math you use you have to have a four-dimensional space well it's just like you can't represent a sphere in Flatland, because there's not, not another dimension for it. It's a two-dimensional thing, right? All you can show is the shadow of it on two dimensions, right? So the same thing is true. If you have a four-dimensional space, you can't show it in three dimensions, right? And so that's the that's the problem with it is you is you can't represent higher dimensional spaces in lower dimensional spaces, right? For example, yeah. if you have a two-dimensional space. And there's properties associated with the number of dimensions. If you have a two-dimensional space, you cannot create a knot in it because you have to have a third dimension to loop it. So once you have a three-dimensional space, you can make a knot. But if you have a four-dimensional space, then the knot has an extra dimension and you can pull it out like a magician's loop. Wow, yeah. Okay, so the properties of what we think about as physics has totally to do with the standard, our, our un, unassuming that we don't even realize that we're doing it. We're just unconsciously thinking it's a three-dimensional space, right? It, it's amazing, so. yeah. And it, because we, we're so conditioned to think linearly, aren't we? Like everything, you know. Oh, and three-dimensional. Yeah, yeah, and three-dimensional. <laughs> Linear and three, you know. Yeah. Every every EBIT, it turns out, is four dimensions. Well, where is it then? So that's what's so spooky action at a distance about EBITs. Oh.